Lord's mind and Holy Spirit to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, our fourth week in Advent here, and it's good to be together again. As we go to our second Sunday, this is a, a season of, of waiting, a time of waiting. We, we wait to remember and celebrate the coming of our Savior, Jesus, uh, the Son of God, who, who left the, the right hand of the Father to enter into our world. And He didn't come in power with His glory, that was a good for us, but He came to be a lowly being born. Four more days of symbolic time of waiting to be over and we'll pause to celebrate Christmas. And if you've been journeying with us through this time, I'll let you know that we have some resources available for you. We, we have on our website uh, some, we have a special file that was put together last year by the Peterson Center, which you can download. And we also have some devotionals that were given by some specific writers at that time. If you didn't know that, I'll encourage you to go to the Peterson website to see that one devotional that they did for this year. So, I'll encourage you to check it out. So now we're here in our last, in our last Sunday of Advent, which is through this theme, Biblical Theme of Love. And it can be a tricky topic because the word itself is used so often, but so many people don't stop to define that word. And we have dual using it to define all the things. We have so many different commercials and uh, almost infinite number of commercials trying to sell us different products or different cars to be in so many movies. And especially now that we turn Christmas time, it's easy to see love as this consumer mentality where it's us purchasing for others to show our love to them. And if we're not careful, we can even spend all of our time tempting things that others are not actually interested in. The reason that all of these things can sell us love in this way is that because as humans, we have this deep longing, this desire to be in love. And those are good desires because the Bible tells us that God is love. And He says He tells us how it is good. So for us to have that desire to be loved, it's a good desire. But if we take our cues from the culture around us, Tell us that love is something temporary, something that we could fall into and, and most fully accept by, by our success, and then something that we could fall out of and, and appreciate and grow. Or our hopes for self pity or something simply emotional, such as to have our own feelings and then go home. Or if we're going to give a suggestion that's so shallow that it's turned on a hallmark card and back to someone else and say, Well, I don't think that that's good. You can give it to them. Um, but, but it can be so ill defined that we don't know. God's love for sinners is something completely different than all of us. Something permanent, something concrete, something deep, and comprehensively defined. A love so expansive that it's inexhaustible and makes all human attempts to love others futile. One thing writer says that the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. God has added no quantum or content into the charge of the dying of something I can say in 30 minutes. So let me offer, at least try to offer a definition to you. Comes from a professor of government at the University of Kent. His description is James Dupin. Long name, hard to say. But I think that's how you say it. You know how to say it. Okay. He, he defines all this way a commitment of the will to the true good of another person. That's the definition I'd like to hear, hear this for you as well. I want to start with a little story for you guys. It's, it's a story about my dad. He's here today. He wanted to be here. You guys are right there. Not today. I don't know if he's here. I was going to tell a story about him, but. But ever since I was this big, the early memory I the earliest memory I have, actually no, the earliest memory I have is a pair of twin TVs flying, um, that sometimes you can't just get hungry, and I find that little kids are just looking for their mom from vacation. But, but the second earliest memory I have is of him being telling me that he loved me. Ever since I was a little boy, he was telling me that he loved me. And he wouldn't always just say, I love you. Um, he would often say, who loves you, buddy? And I would say, my family loves me. And um, there was a 
time I'm a teenager, so I really just like that. So I'm not saying this is like a teenager or anything. And uh, as I grow older, I really started to appreciate that because one thing I always do is that my dad loves me. And even, even uh, if I'm a Christian, I think that that's really pretty healthy because when in the Bible there's so much analysis about a heavenly father that loves you, it wasn't really hard for me to make that jump because I mean, my earthly dad loved me and he said that God would love me as well. Um, he didn't just do that in, in order, but he did that in the Bible by providing for me. What he was doing by asking me that question as well, he said he was um, he was catechizing me because um, I forgot to mention this because it's sometimes a lost thing to uh, to learn how to tell you some of these things, but you're actually just sitting in front of them in a uh, question format. So when you when you ask them that, they just keep asking so you know where it's going. And so um, I just want to take a moment and ask you these two brothers that are fathers, what do you do to um, show your kids the love of God and, and to always encourage your brothers and sisters to love them? And to be sure, as, as fathers, when it's done best, and when it's done well, it will be a representation of God, but as it were, um, you know, all fathers are sinful, and, and it could be possible for something like that, so uh, we hope to do that. Our fathers can be sure to be kind and to love. And so I would just ask you, what are you doing to show your these brothers as well? So, um, for those of you guys don't know me, I serve as the, the youth director here at the church, and ever since the beginning, the view for the youth ministry has been to partner with parents, so it's not, it's not where it's just me teaching their kids and I was supposed to mentor someone else, but that could be a shared burden because there's only 52 Sundays a year, and there's only so much that one person can give to your kids. And, and whether you like it or not, as parents to your children, you will be the, the primary influence. So, so it's, it's not to really ask me to help with your work, it's to share that load with the church and parents to play these two roles. That's part of why I share that story. So, um, so I just ask, you know, do your kids know that you love them and you're showing up for them and that that represents? If you have your Bibles with you today, open up to Romans chapter 8. We'll be, in, we'll be picking up in verse 31. That's about the, the sixth book of the, the Bible, the New Testament. So it's, it's going to be close to the end. It starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And then Romans is the, is the sixth, so it's Romans 8. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand for those of us who have you one. You can keep that if you don't have one. That's okay for you. If you don't have one, you have one. That'll be a help for us. Here's the direction we're going to go today. In, in this text, we're going to see how God's love saves us, God speaks the truth to our hearts, and that that love can stop us, but it actually serves others. And I'll just remind you of that definition, that love is the commitment of the will to the true good of another person. One big takeaway I'd like you to have if you forget everything from this sermon or remember nothing else, I want you to know that if you have trusted Jesus, if you put your faith in him, you are secure in God's love. Nothing can separate you from it, whether that's physically or spiritually, and if you have faith, you're secure in that love. I just want to say that again. So pick up in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. As God's word says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn us? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That as we, we head into this celebration of Christmas, celebrating your son, who you wrote right when you were coming to the Bible world and to our world, and then the ultimate gift of his love, that we would be those who are deeply known and close to your son. Pray that it would penetrate into our hearts this morning, and that it would give us the confidence we need to know that God is with us and he loves us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's love. 
the entire argument here with the Supreme Court has dealt with hinges on this idea of justification. That's what we saw in the Supreme Court. God is justified. And it's important to stop and define those kinds of words. Um, I'll, I'll take my definition from a guy named Jeff Packer. He's a great theologian for the last century. He's still alive today. so far as to say that the center of all of Paul's theology, the guy who wrote Romans, the center of it is justification by faith. So that even agrees with that, but a lot of people think that. And regardless, we can we can know for sure that it maybe just begins with Romans justification or at least at least the first chapter. So this judicial act has to do with the idea of a court ruling. I've heard the story a bunch of times you may or may not have heard it, I can't think of a better illustration for this because here how it's been explained the justification of God. The illustration just would be of a
strength, strength the number of all the people in Red Wing. So the lake is really in the lake of that lake. It's just a deep, profound sense of the way of the lake. We love it. It's kind of really not like we've seen the way of the lake. It's really a theme song that talks to us, but almost in all different kinds of ways. And this one, to me, was kind of the less of the way of the lake. I know it was a song that was chosen to be the thesis text of the Yes, the righteous persecuted with our persecution. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The woman was actually died for the righteous person. And perhaps, for a good person, we would dare to be even better. But God shows his love for us. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have questions about Before my recent demise to the stuff of God, the incarnation of Jesus, and his birth, this is one step in being like his most important work of the crucifixion. If the incarnation did not lead to the crucifixion, I wish God might show his love to us in many ways through that. Thus, Jesus left the glory of sitting at the right hand of the Father, entering into all eternity. The point of suffering, he born in an animal's skin. While his life was very important, it wasn't the living of his life that he wanted to focus on. To what he did to me, but his life for the sins of other people. Jesus was one of the best sinners that we will ever hear. God loves us by saying, How is it? If you're an Adam, don't just be a rival and demand you do what's desirable. God loves our love. Do you know that? Do you know that love like the same thing as the kind of love that Jesus expressed to his own disciples? Now, he had paid for those sins and was still doing what he did to God. What is it? What is the living of his life? I know when somebody picks my day, I feel very blessed. Anytime I go out to dinner and somebody else picks your day, I remember it. I don't know how much. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I brought my daughter a knife to get a haircut, and we got the snippet to see because I thought it was pretty much kind of dirty, and I thought it was a nice thing that somebody else had picked out. She said, Merry Christmas, don't worry about that. I remember it. I felt very loved, especially because I got this thing for like $20 and spam, but but I can't get away with this still, so it's, it's probably worth it. Um, in John, in one of John's epistles, it puts it this way. He defines love this way. This is how God shows his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For us, if we look for Christmas in that he would send his son for us, not just to give us an example of how to live our lives, but again, he would give his life for us. That he would die for us. That he would justify us by giving his life and substituting for death in our place. Because God is for us, he justifies us by loving us. We feel like so secure in that notion that he took something like this and sent his son out for us. It's easy for a lot of people to say, I know God loves me. I feel the difficulty comes along, and so this can never be a good thing. If God's love for you is so secure that nothing can stop it, as the pitfall to Moses with the nine angels and the ten plagues would say, His word is on. It can't be undone. It can't not be gone back up. As humans, as far as fickleness, we come up with objections to God's love. And I, I thought of some myself. These are these are just really speaking out of, out of my own life. So maybe some of that will have some familiar to you. Sometimes you could phrase things like this. There's no way God could love me after all the things I've done. Or, I'm just not a lovable person. I'm too sinful for God to love me. Or, how could God possibly love someone like me? He knew what he did, what I've done, he'd never love me. If he loved me, why would he allow all these terrible things to happen to me? Why did he stop others from coming to love me? These sound like good objections on the surface. Do I just call them what they are? It's a lie. But they're not true. I would encourage you not to believe these things if you feel unrational to think them. You know, I don't know what some people might do. I don't think I've ever had feelings given to my own life. I don't want to speak into that. 
seven out of ten, I would point out that. Verse 34, you see the distinction. So right now, you see that the right hand of the Father is saying, I'm for this person. They say to the divine faith for this person. Will you do the same with your life? We're going to see in the history right now. If you look back for the verse, you see verse 26, for all these who will. And the Holy Spirit is also in the same place. He's also spoken of who he was and who he is. And then God the Father in verse 31 is also saying, Hold on to the day you hear of our one God that they're for you. In verse 28, it says that all things even bad things work out for the good of God's people. God is for you. The creator of the world is for you. So even if everything, everything in creation is against you, it doesn't matter. Because the one who made it all, he is still for you. Even Satan, because of Revelation tells us he's lost our memory, he's limping right now. He is against you both. But the creator is for you. He's he's true to you. So so he can't be put into those places. Even yourself, if you're true to you, in your own heart, in your own self power, God can overcome that. Any person in society that's against you, God's against you. He's for you. He can't can't separate you from him. He doesn't sit in isolation, but separates us. He says, head from his body. He cannot separate him from the love of God. Anything that comes under love is the love of God. Tim Ryan and August Cockley, he was a teacher of August Cockley Church there. He wrote a hymn that ends with this verse. I'm better to mercy with the mind, covenant mercy I sin, and fear with my righteousness bound, and my person and all things are burned. The terrors of law and of God, with me can have nothing to do. Thy sins of sin and blood, and all my sins rest upon the view. The work which is given to men, Jesus, come up for us. Do we not also do this all the same? 
way God serves us is by giving to us. Some of you might be familiar with, with how Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, he says, Son of man came out to be served, to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here in Romans 12, we are going to see the greatest relief. And God's already given you this son. Won't he give us all things? In that sense, we can be encouraged to give to others because we belong to the kingdom of the kingdom of God. But in order to serve somebody, it requires the giving of our resources. It's not money, possessions, or our sacrifice of time. At Christmas time, we celebrate Jesus coming to us and we express our love to others for giving and gifts. And part of that is to demonstrate the gospel in that God wants his object of love Give our time, our talents, and our time. I always remember that because it's just nice to remember everything. So, in the U.S., I find it often puzzling our time that's hardest to give up. I find it's really easy to jump into Terry Key's football farm and give him money, but it's actually more hard to, to get down in the sense and actually serve with him. And then when it comes to talents, but I don't find that to be that hard as well because in my own resources, which this is right now, seems to make my income about me and not about serving someone else. So I would encourage you during this Christmas time, find a way to be present with Jesus, to count your time with him sacrificially, and, and find a way to actually enjoy that because the way God can, can tune your heart in such a way where the pain substitution of your time would actually be beneficial to you and good for you as well. It's not bad to give your time, or else giving your talents and your treasures. I would encourage you to do that as well, but I think, I think here in the West, it's often our time that's hardest to give up. I would encourage you to find a way to put down that iPhone and let this year be present with Jesus a little bit. Even if it's that annoyed you when you leave it behind. I know the feeling of having to pedal to things to do lists to do work and these different projects and chores that are always full of getting time. But I think that uh, when I see people pull their heart into Jesus and pull it out of the list and see the busyness that it is in my life, I'm not always going to be time to give up and serve. So giving is, is the key thing, and, and through this video, I'm hinting at is that what we want to be is objects of his love and then ambassadors of his love, of his love to others. Before he tells us what to do, though, he always tells us who we are in the story. Christ left the world of Jesus, but he gave up his pleasure so he could bring you the Father to come down here and be with us, that we would be the Emmanuel, God with us, the Jesus we call him, the ultimately certain person who was and was and is dead. He's given us his son, and what better gift could we give? The most famous verse of the Bible, John 15, 15, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Does God not been happy to give us all things? Some object to this. I pray for stuff and not receive it until I get into things all things. How can I possibly be set? It's true, we don't always see the answers to our prayers in this life. Sometimes that's because what we're praying for is sinful. Sometimes it's a way of prayer, how we prioritize God's kingdom. How can you come your will be done, not my will? Sometimes we don't receive what we want because it's inherently sinful and evil. Sometimes it's because it could be a good thing. What father would what loving father would ever want to give a child to someone that he just doesn't know that could be done to him? Other times, the answer to the prayer is wait. He might not receive it in this life, but the great secret that answers it will one day when we come to see it. In the book of Revelation, book of Revelation the last book of the Bible, the, the last chapter has these words in it. To the angel who is the river of the water of life, great as crystal, flowing from the throne of God to the Lamb. Of the seas of the sea. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, giving its fruit its month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any sea or place, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. He will see their face, and his name will not be spoiled. Night will be no more. There will be no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign. Someday you're going to reign with God, with Jesus. Presently, we live in this tense of in between time. In the Bible, if you read it, sometimes it speaks of the kingdom of God as it has arrived right now. But every time, it speaks of it as it is still yet to come. We live in this tension between the now, not the kingdom of present time, but the 
not yet to get to the country. But the other thing that they said, and they get to the country, but they said, sometimes it's hard to answer. Yes, now, you can have this job, but sometimes it's hard to answer. No, not yet. I still have work to do with you. So we keep this kind of future life, and the future life needs to come and bring you The thing you need to understand is that the giver, it's always the giver who gives, and God gave you the stuff that you brought. That's the standard of the cross. That's how God gave you the stuff. You don't get to end the prayer. You're not getting what you want. I were in a boat and I had, I had a, a rope attached to the dock and I needed to get out of the boat, I would pull myself closer to that dock. You could just feel as if the dock was getting closer to me, but in reality, I'm becoming pulled closer to that dock. That's what prayer is like sometimes. It's not to bring God closer to us, but rather to bring us closer to God. God's economy is scandalous to our hearts and minds. It makes no sense that He would come as a king, not as a king, that His prayer would be a blood on the cross. Paul says to follow each other. He killed all the things for his sake. But he follows that up with, we are more than conquerors in him who loved us. Paul, are you crazy? How can we be more than conquerors for his sake? He's ready to people that would seem to be very real persecution. No. God twists the strength, the power of the world, and set up the cross. God conquers sin and death for us. Not with a sword, but with love. God giving his great life for us. He buys us from everything. That is love. If you trust in that, you will be born and conquer. See, in, in a battle, you could win a battle with really tremendous life. Right? You, could, you could win with this life a little bit while you've lost great lives. And there are, there are lives that are not ruined by war. But in this battle, this spiritual battle, we could all lose our lives. But not in Christ. If we take it back up with us, and if we die in Him, we live again. Nothing can take us away from Him. We cannot be separated from Him. If you trust in Jesus now, someday you will resurrect again. But if you have not we look forward to celebrating the return of Jesus Christ. But always in context of the joint and dignity of Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate. This is really coming to give his life for us. Amen. So we're going to celebrate the So I invite you to come up. If you know him, if you know his love, you can't be separated from him. You can. So we're going to have mine for us. Represent his body that was broken for you on the cross. So we're going to have wine and juice according to your faith. Represent his love that was poured out for you on the cross. At the cross, he was willing to leave the right hand of the Father and then to enter into our world. He did that, and that's what we celebrate this week. See, he could, he could handle being separated momentarily from the Father because he knew the Father loved him. He knew that the Father loved him, and he could go to the cross and suffer for us, and that even death could not save him. We celebrate this with you, and nothing can separate us. Thank you.